So if somebody is, say for example, wanting to export anything from India, and if they're making a particular type of product for the Indian market, there's no guarantee that the same product will sell there. Mm -hmm. So you have to make a product according to the market there. And therefore, I learned, of course, as a, being a part of that exhibition, that if I want to sell to those markets, I have to make products suitable for them to buy. Mm. When we wanted to choose a product category, as I said, rubber fits everywhere. Yeah. Tires, wiper blades, light beadings, everything. Mm -hmm. So much rubber. But if you want volumes, if you want regular orders, the part has to have very frequent replacement. Mm. And strategically, that part has to be in the most ill-treated part of the car. And that is under the car. So we looked under the car to look for products and we found the silencer or the exhaust system as the first point of contact for us to identify products. Failure is a must. Until you experience failure, you will not enjoy the success. And that is crucial for everybody. But your path to success may be different from person to person. Sure. Your situations may be different. But the size of the opportunity today in this country is huge. huge. Welcome to the Raj Smriti Show. Today we have with us Mr. Kiran Chopra, who is a rubber technologist. Let's know more about him and his work. Welcome to the show, sir. Hi, thank you, Smriti. Thank you so much for coming. And you know, you are in a kind of a profession where not many people are aware. Even though we use rubber all the time in the various devices, cars, anywhere and everywhere. Absolutely. I think our life is uh, impossible without rubber if we imagine today's scenario. True. So give us an insight into the kind of work that you do, the industry that you belong to. Well, I uh, got into this phase of my life uh, very early. I was still in school and uh, my father, who was uh, earlier working in one of the businesses in the family, decided to uh, branch out on his own and he started this company. Uh, he bought, in fact, a company which was making rubber components. Okay. And he comes from an automobile background. So he kind of applied that application for the rubber components that he wanted to manufacture to the auto sector. So that was initially the thought behind creating this company or forming or buying this company. So he, uh, when he bought that company, I was still in school mm -hmm. and I was being a science student. I was definitely, you know, inquisitive to know what rubber is, how you manufacture components made out of rubber. And I started to go to that very, very small, tiny factory. It was uh, definitely not uh, evolved in terms of technology mm -hmm. because I'm talking of the year 1970, 71. Wow. So I was still in school and I used to bicycle 10 kilometers and go to the factory and just spend the entire day whenever I had a vacation or when I was in the summer vacations or even the winter vacations. And I was so engrossed with what was happening in the factory that uh, it kind of became uh, an obsession with me to know more about the subject, mm -hmm. especially since, you know, this business belonged to the family. Yes. So that is what took me into this area of rubber. And uh, um, of course, as you rightly said, rubber has extensive applications. But to start with, we focused on the automotive sector. And okay. uh, that is, uh, in fact, the purpose behind establishing that company. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about the automotive sector, the rubber that is used in the cars, the vehicles, all kinds of vehicles, you are into manufacturing that. Yes. In fact, as you rightly said, rubber, anything and everything that you use today, uh, from furniture to electronics to automobiles, you have some part of rubber being used somewhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were, uh, in fact, when we chose the automotive sector, the automotive sector also is a very diverse application of rubber from tires mm -hmm. to if you look inside the engine or the hood of a car, you will find multiple rubber parts, rubber including parts. wiper blades and everything. Mm -hmm. So we can't do everything, of course, we couldn't possibly think of doing everything. So we focused on some aspects of the automobile, 
which perhaps was not our choice mm -hmm. but when we approached a customer if there was something automotive rubber application in the automotive sector we took that as business because we wanted to do business in this space mm -hmm. so your business is uh, located in lucknow but then you are everywhere if you take the entire world the globe as a scenario you export everywhere and it's a huge market a lot of people feel that you know to build a successful business and an empire you need to move out from your uh, parent city go to a big city a metro town only then you can have a successful business so how was this a conscious choice to be based out in a small town and then work across the globe well you see you're right lucknow is definitely not a place to have industry hmm. in fact the biggest industry in uh, lucknow and up is politics yeah so so manufacturing was certainly not an industry which uh, thrived in up and lucknow in particular and uh, at that time when we were doing business they had only two cars in the country okay. the ambassador car and the fiat car mm -hmm. and they made 2000 odd vehicles every month which is nothing for a company to supply to and also they were located one in calcutta one in mumbai so there was no chance for us to sit in lucknow and supply to them mm -hmm. so we looked around for business uh, my father had some contacts in some bombay based companies they made lambretta scooters so he had some old connect we were able to get some small business from them some from the south part of india where they have a very thriving automotive uh, component industry so we were able to get bits and pieces of business but definitely not in a position to build scale Hmm. that means to grow the size of our business to the extent we wanted to and soon after that i went to the uk okay. to do my specialization in rubber and when i came back i uh, of course we had very old archaic equipment and machinery but still having understood the art of making a good quality rubber product i convinced my father that we should look at the global markets hmm. now in the 70s uh, late 70s when we started thinking on those lines a made in india product was not a very welcome product anywhere in the world mm -hmm. so of course there those those were the days when you didn't have a mobile phone you had phones which did not work yeah you had uh, no telex no email no internet nothing so if you wanted to communicate with somebody abroad uh, and to find out who that company was if you wanted to do business you'd have to go to a library and look at some database mm -hmm. printed database then write a letter then wait for 15 days to get a reply wow. so that was the time we thought you know we would attempt to get some business from overseas markets mm -hmm. and when that was not a very enterprising way to you know get things done um i told my father that we should participate or at least visit a trade fair you know a focused mm. trade fair so this is something that everybody who's doing a business in the global market should understand that if you want to sell a particular product for a particular application for a particular industry the best way is to find out where the entire world meets under one roof for that product category mm. so for our product category which is automotive the largest trade fair was in germany Hmm. and that was of course we found that information in a library and through magazines and journals mm -hmm. and decided that we should participate in a fair in germany to understand what the world is doing, doing. in the automotive sector and at least learn from that now fortunately the government of india was at that time subsidizing to some extent participation okay so we were a very small company we could not afford Uh, this entire cost of participation and we were fortunate we got that little support and i ventured out and uh, i carried a whole lot of samples mm. of what we were making you know we were very impressed with the quality we were making and we thought we'll impress the people who would be interested to buy rubber yeah. products but that was an error i i learned from that one trip that if you're going to sell to a market global market you can't sell them what you make you have to sell what they need mm. you have to show them what they need that's such a wonderful uh, yeah thought. so mm -hmm. so if somebody is say for example wanting to export anything from india and if they are making a particular type of product for the indian market 
there's no uh, guarantee that the same product will sell there. Mm -hmm. So you have to make a product according to the market there. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, uh, I learned, of course, as a, being a part of that exhibition, that if I want to sell to, to those markets, I have to make products suitable for them to buy. Mm. The people who visited our stand, they saw our products. They said, very good quality, but which of the German cars or which of the European cars does this fit in? And I said, they don't. Mm. And uh, they didn't seem interested after that. So that got us to think that we must have a range of products which interests the European customer. Custom, rightly said. So, so good takeaway that, you know, if you want to expand, you have to. And as you said that, you know, in Lucknow or in any other place, if you are starting a business and you don't have a market there, you have to approach to people. And the best way is through fairs and conferences and a lot of other get togethers that happen at the professional level. How does education help? To, is useful for businessmen and entrepreneurs when they are into this kind of sector. You went to UK to do your course in rubber technology. So that I believe is a very specialized course and a lot of people are not even aware of it. You know, the kind of profession or the kind of empire that you and your family has built. People don't even think on those lines. Even though we use cars, we see rubber right there. But, you know, just thinking that there's a huge market for it. There's a huge demand for it and you can set up something like it. So how how was your education into this sector and what all you gathered when you went to UK? Yeah, so uh, first of all, this college I went to, it's called the National College of Rubber Technology okay. based in London. And uh, it's part of London Metropolitan University now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the most famous college for uh, doing a course in rubber. And uh, because I had little exposure in our own company, our own manufacturing company, I had that slight advantage of understanding the subject, perhaps more than students who were absolutely freshers. freshers. So uh, I had a head start in that respect. And because it was uh, the process of being educated was to apply it to our business, hmm. I was looking at my education always from that perspective of how I can apply it to our business. Mm. And I collected a lot of information about companies, about products, about machinery, about technology, as it would apply to our company. And when uh, we acquired, or at least I was able to get that experience of making a good quality rubber product, to run a business, you can't just have technology. You mm. must have orders. And you must have continuous orders. Yeah. So when I went to Germany the second time, and after the first time when I realized that you have to make a product suitable to their, to market, their market, I went to the market in Germany and bought a lot of parts okay. which are popular there just to see what they look like and brought them back to India and developed all of these parts at our own time and cost mm. and went back next year to the same fair with those products which the Germans and Europeans recognize. Mm -hmm. And immediately, you know, they uh, kind of, they, uh, the products caught their interest and they started to look at them with interest. But the problem at that time was they were not very sure about the Indian manufacturing capability. Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, uh, we've had a bad experience with Indian suppliers. They show us something else, they supply us something else. So it was a struggle to even convince them that India can manufacture rubber products. And uh, in a 10 day fair, it was a struggle talking to people and trying to tell them that, look, we can do what the rest of the world is doing. Mm -hmm. In those days, there were countries like Turkey, there was countries like Taiwan, Korea, Thailand and Cambodia, which were making good quality rubber products, but India was not on their radar. Okay, And uh, the first order we got, in fact, uh, in the late 70s or early 80s, was on a very uh, ridiculous business terms. Mm -hmm. And as they say, you know, experience teaches you a lot of things. Then I realized that they're not going to do business with us because of the reputation that Indian companies had created, bad reputation mm -hmm. that Indian companies had created. Um, the terms we did the first, got the first order on was that, look, if you're convinced that the product you see is good, we will take your order, 
we will supply the goods, you test the goods, you sell the goods, and if you are convinced, you pay us. Wow, that was a huge risk in those so, times. So they actually thought we were crazy. Mm. And he said, I had never seen a businessman who was uh, taking such a big risk. I said, it's not a risk. It's on the only way to break into a market which is not ready to look at India. And after we got that first order and we executed that order, it is only after that that the German company, that was a German company, which was convinced that yes, this company can deliver as per our expectations. Mm -hmm. And then we got, of course, repeat orders and thereafter, uh, you know, it was something that kept going for several years and the same company became a collaborator with us mm -hmm. and became a joint venture partner. So he'll stop buying from everywhere else over the years and continue to buy from mm -hmm. us. So risk taking is an integral part of business and I think a lot of uh, people suffer with that because when you're not a risk taker and you don't take a risk, your business tend to tumble and uh, people have ideas, they want to do it. But somewhere because of this risk taking initiative, which is not there, they are not able to succeed. Other than this, what all other challenges did you face and what, what are the key skills that you should have? when you are into a business sector or you are, you know, running an organization? Well, you see, we started with Germany and we expanded to Europe. And then once we did Europe, we wanted to expand further. And we went to the US, Australian, Canadian and other markets in the world. So one thing that is uniform across any business, whether it is business doing business in India or overseas, mm -hmm. there are four or five components to make that business successful. Yeah. The first and foremost is that you must have a range of products that okay. the customer wants. That means like you go to a mall and you do everything under one roof, all mm. your shopping under one roof, even the customer wants to go to limited number of suppliers. So you must have a full range. Mm. Secondly, you must have the ability to communicate on time with the customer. Communication is very, very, very important. crucial. For example, we are dealing with time zones in uh, the US and to Australia, which are 20 hours apart. Yeah. And uh, in a situation like this, we have dedicated people in our company which respond real time to inquiries or communication received from, say, USA mm -hmm. at late at night or Australia early in the early morning. Early in the morning. So people are responding and that aspect of communication is very key to getting the at, uh, the confidence of the customer instilled in your ability to supply. Mm. The third thing is that we have to supply on time. And in today's day and age, when people don't want to carry inventories, they want the goods to be arriving on their doorstep when they want it. Yeah. And that just in time kind of concept of supplies is something we built the ability to do over the years. Mm -hmm. And that actually is appreciated by the customer because delays will disrupt the entire supply chain. Mm. And the fourth aspect is the ability to develop, design, develop and deliver new products from time to time, which ability we also created within our organization. Mm. And finally, of course, is the fact that, uh, you know, we were able to customize packaging needs of the customer. That means if a customer wanted in a particular form of packaging, a particular type of automated machine had to be installed, we did all of that and we learnt as we went along from the customer. Mm -hmm. So these are aspects which actually uh, ensured that our relationship with the customer was, in fact, uh, it's, it's, some, it's a fact that, you know, we are proud to own that in our uh, 40 plus years of doing business overseas, we have not lost a single customer. Wow. And at times uh, we even struggled because uh, to get new markets because a lot of what happened in the 90s was coming from China. Hmm. And we realized that to compete with a country like China, when we went to new customers, they said we are happy buying from China. We don't want to move to India. Okay. Uh, two reasons. One, China was frightfully cheap at that time. And India was not a very favored manufacturing uh, destination, destination to buy from. So then we applied a new strategy. In fact, when we chose, let me go back to when the first time we went to Germany, 
when we wanted to choose a product category, as I said, rubber fits everywhere, yeah. tires, wiper blades, uh, light beadings, everything, mm -hmm. so much rubber. But if you want volumes, if you want regular orders, the part has to have very frequent replacement. Mm. And strategically, that part has to be in the most ill-treated part of the car. And that is under the car. Mm. So we looked under the car to look for products and we found the silencer or the exhaust system as the first point of contact for us to identify products. And the silencer is the most heated, most ill-treated part of any car. Mm. And therefore, the rubber pieces that suspend the silencer were actually being replaced very frequently. frequently. So we chose that for getting two things, one regular business and of course, uh, volumes. volume. So the samples I picked up are from the exhaust system category. Mm. So we uh, built a complete range. And for every make and model of car that drives on the planet today, we have a product for that. Wow. So, and we focused on the aftermarket. That means we were not supplying to the original car maker mm -hmm. for simple reason that if a car maker had 20 plants across the world, we couldn't have 20 factories across the world. So we chose to be in the aftermarket, in the replacement market. And the reason why we chose the replacement market was because we could supply to anybody from India, mm. number one. Number two, uh, we did not have to supply on a daily basis to punish the assembly line requirements. And third, we were not bound by certain very heavily penalty-based liabilities. Mm. That means if there was a failure in a car for a particular component, and if the rubber component happened to be part of the drivetrain, we would end up paying huge penalties, which we could never afford. Mm. And a lot of companies have closed on account of this liability issue. Mm. So we stayed away from that and we stuck to the aftermarket. And over the years, uh, 15 years after we went into the exhaust business, we realized that fuel-based cars uh, or internal combustion engines, uh, petrol and diesel-based engines would gradually go away. And mm. we can see that happening today. Yeah. EVs are coming in, hydrogen, alternate fuels. Yes. So we thought that we cannot sustain growth in the exhaust area and we moved to another part under the car. And in this case, we saw uh, uh, you know, a situation which was uh, uh, suspension. You know, it was the four parts of a car, mm -hmm. uh, four corners of a car where the steering and the suspension is there. So these are also rubber parts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we transited from exhaust to rubber wow. in the suspension area. And uh, we built a complete range over a period of time. It took us another five, seven years to build that full range. And today we are equally divided between exhaust and ride control. And we don't restrict ourselves to that because we can do anything now in molded rubber. And we are open to looking at new avenues. Today we are talking of uh, areas which are other than automotive. Uh, the defense sector is there mm. and there are so many other, the railway sector is there. There's right. so many sectors which use rubber. So we are now gradually trying to create more verticals in this. Coming back to that part about the strategy. Mm -hmm. When China became our adversary in terms of uh, competing in the market, we realized that uh, to break into China, the best, was, best way was to go into China. Mm. So there was a big exhibition in China. There were 6,500 exhibitors and we were the only Indian company and everybody thought we were crazy to go and try and sell in China. But our intention was twofold. One, of course, to show the Chinese that we can make the same product at as good a price. And two, to catch the customers who were so focused on China to look at India as a manufacturing destination. Hmm. So when a Chinese customer walked into our stand and he saw all the products and the quality of what we were doing, the first question he asked was, where is your factory in China? Mm -hmm. And we said, we don't have a factory in China. And they were surprised to see that all this is made in India. And that is when we realized that Indian manufacturing is not exposed to the world. And that needs to happen. Again, once we broke the ice with some customers, we convince them that how does it matter to you whether you buy from China or India, if you're getting the right price at the right time at the right quality. Mm. So all these three aspects convince some customers 
to start a small order with us. Mm -hmm. so let's say if somebody sitting in Canada, he orders uh, something on us and we deliver. And uh, when we met him the next time, we asked him, was there any difference in quality, price or time of delivery? He said, no, everything was just perfect. In fact, better because your communication levels are better. better. The Chinese don't speak such good English mm -hmm. or communicate in English. So they actually appreciated the advantage of doing business with us. So we pulled away a lot of China centric customers to us in India because they realized that if they can get all the benefits and some more from Indian companies, why should they buy from China? True. And if they have to buy from China, they have to have a person stationed to look after their interest of uh, communicating with the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So all this we overcome and we took away almost 10 customers who were very China focused and brought them to us as customers. Wow, that's uh, so much of learning right there that you know you've constantly been researching things, innovating things and you know trying to be up to the mark to the global market and you have never taken no to anything. So, you know, first thing when you come to the mind, that China is doing all the things that they just leave it. Why should we, you know, the fear of competition. We don't even think of competing exactly. when we know that there is a superpower right there. But you broke that barrier and you thought, why not? Let's do it in that way. And I think that is one of the key learnings for all our business uh, people who are venturing into business or who already have business. During COVID times and otherwise also, this is an era of startup. And we've seen a lot of traditional businesses being shut, new startups coming up, but not everyone is able to thrive. The three, four key learnings that you gave us that, you know, right communication has to be there. Absolutely. The trust factor has to be there. What you say, you have to deliver. There has to be risk taking. You have to do constant research. And I think you are one of the great example of researching things when there was nothing available. Exactly. We are born in the internet era where, you know, at the click of the mouse, everything is available. Rather too much of it. But you use the libraries, the traditional ways and explored the world when we couldn't even think of, you know, going there. So these startups who are not able to thrive and then they, you know, they don't know what to do. They end up in huge debts. What is your message to them? How should they, you know, come out of things or what should they do to build up a successful business? Well, uh, you see, I, I was uh, telling you a little while ago that geography is history. Yes. Geography see, is history. So when we started, we had nothing, no tools. Hmm. Even the suitcase I had to carry to go to Europe had no wheels. Yeah. So I would carry 25, 30 kilos those traditional VIP suitcase suitcases that came, yeah, yeah. without any wheels and mm. you had to walk miles with that suitcase. So I, I could uh, never imagine today if anybody trying to do that. Mm. So coming back to what I said, see, geography has it's become history. history. That means it doesn't matter where you are now to do business. So we started with a disadvantage of being in Lucknow, which is landlocked. We have no connectivity road or otherwise as efficient as perhaps in the port cities. Mm -hmm. So we had that disadvantage, but today that is not so. Apart from geography being history, science fiction is gradually becoming a reality. That means whatever we dreamt of, you know, mobile phones, internet, these were dreams yes. uh, 30 years ago. Today they've all become a reality. So science fiction is becoming a reality. Business is happening at the speed of thought. That means you're driving, you're walking, you're taking a lift, you're, you're actually making decisions, whether it's through a mobile phone or, you know, communicating through the email or whatever, you're actually taking decisions on the move. So there's not a minute wasted. So business is happening at the speed of thought. You think of something and you start reacting and start to execute that. Mm. Fourth is that the only constant now is change. Mm. That means what happened in the first 30 years, happened in the next 20, happened in the next 10, happened in the next 5. Today, every month, there has been a uh, dramatic change in whatever we are doing in terms of technology. So, uh, change is the only constant. And one biggest aspect for anybody doing business, whether it's a startup, is that we cannot exist in isolation. We mm -hmm. cannot isolate ourselves from either the market, the world, where as far as business is concerned. So, we are as integrated with the world as anybody else's. So we are part of that ecosystem. 
So coming back to your question about startups, well, you see, what is a startup? A startup is a problem solving idea Hmm. using innovation and technology and making life easier for people to do the same thing that they were finding difficulty in doing. That is what basically a startup is doing. It's a God-given gift. Well, I I don't know whether to put it in that context, but India is endowed with problems. Yeah. (laughs) So we are facing problems in every situation that we experience on a day-to-day basis. Mm. So that is where the size of the opportunity is. That is uh, where the size of uh, the solution is. And that is the kind of startup that people should be working on in the sense Mm. that anybody, you see, if somebody didn't get a taxi and Uber was created, somebody didn't get food or variety of food at his home, Zomato happened and Swiggy happened. Mm. So similarly, the, the thought behind this is that, is it solving a problem that affects the man on the street and the man sitting in that, mention Mm -hmm. is it touching everybody let's say the manufacturing sector now if you take the manufacturing sector name a product which the lowest strata of society is using and the highest strata of society is using Mm -hmm. name a product plastic plastic bags take the button button. can you imagine anybody anywhere not using a button Mm -hmm. or a zipper for that matter also let's take the example of a a toothbrush Mm -hmm. Now, I would find it difficult to believe that there is a single household which is not using a toothbrush. So, see, that is the product spread that you must have. Any business you do, it must touch the entire strata of society. Mm. If you're solving a problem, whether it is a product, whether it is a service. Service. Number one. Number two, the, the rate of growth is very important. And when I say that, Today, if Swiggy and say Zomato are doing what they're doing, why has not a Reliance or a Tata or a Mahindra jumped into the fray and started to do the same thing? Mm. Because they grew at such speed at a time when people were still wondering what they're trying to do. And they've created a customer base, which is so huge that today, if somebody wanted to try and do that, it would take them not only years, but cost Mm. them a fortune. Yeah. So the first mover advantage is always important. That means if you start a business idea, whether it is a startup, whether it is a product, you must build your scale at the earliest. And to be able to do that, the conviction, the passion with which you are doing it and the ability to cost correct. When COVID happened, Hmm. who could have thought that thriving businesses would come to a grinding halt? And I'm giving you an example of say a cinema hall, a restaurant, an airline, mm. a hotel. Yes. All of these businesses. The entire travel industry came crashing down. Anything which was people facing, mm. anybody that came in contact with people, all those industries which were doing exceedingly well came to a grinding halt. Mm. And who would have imagined that? But some of them died a slow death. Yeah. Some of them survived. And those who survived had the ability to step back rethink, reconfigure, pivot to a new way of doing the same thing or uh, course correct to doing either the same thing in a different way or finding another way of doing Doing business. So this this ability to pivot and course correct and to step back and think. So of course, uh, the businesses had a buffer. That means they had created a buffer for a plan B if a contingency happened. Right. So this is also important that when you have a business, you must create a buffer for a situation which is out of your control, unmanageable, and you should have a plan B in place. Mm. So this is what is important for any business. Even for us, uh, during COVID, uh, there was a problem in shipping goods. There was a problem in getting people to work. Of course, automobiles were still running. Yeah. There was no restriction of COVID on people driving their cars. Mm-hmm. So if you're driving cars, you're replacing parts, parts and right. they need parts. And how do we produce without people? Mm. But we created during that one, one and a half months of lockdown, we created a process whereby we could get in people in a staggered way, keep the social distancing in place in our workplace, mm. still continue to manufacture, 
we uh, engaged with transport companies to deliver material transport our material to the shipping companies so all this was a learning process yes. and again uh, having gone through this we realized that in future if you know face a situation where uh, it is beyond your control a plan b is already Always. in place yeah. interesting so talking about change as you sa- said that you know change is the only thing constant and it will be we have now shifted ourselves to the digital world the digital media how do you see the digital <laughs> world and how much involved you are digitally how your business functions on digital platform and what is your message to people who are onto the social media whether it's good bad we see so many you know feedbacks of people that you know it's good it's not good it's harming your eyes it's uh, harming your brain it's causing depression you are on the social media you also use it uh, i'm sure for both work and uh, personal uh, usage yeah so you know when we we got into uh, using technology or computers by force because all our customers overseas mm. were using computers much earlier than we were doing in mm. india and in they india, were heavily email based they would use email yeah so so like for example i went to a customer and i asked him i said can you give me a forecast for next year for us to plan i'm talking of uh, early 90s mm-hmm. and he's and i was hoping that you know he'd make me write down all those figures month wise product wise he says no can you wait for 10 minutes i'll give you everything and i said how can you do that in 10 minutes and he sat on his computer and uh, he pulled out some information data and he pressed a button and there was these dot matrix printers you know which would mm-hmm. go making a noise up and down right. the head would go mm-hmm. printing on a perforated paper yeah. if you yeah, remember that yeah i've seen that i've seen a that. lot of today's generation won't know about yeah, it i've seen that so and in about 10 minutes he had 6 7 sheets of paper printed for me and he had the whole product list with the schedule for the whole year month wise everything and he handed it over to me and i was absolutely amazed to see that entire data come out in 10 minutes oh. of course uh, today if somebody would yeah. laugh at me and say how can you be amazed but mm-hmm. at that time when there was no computers in india it was something to be fascinated about and that is when we realized that we must also try and become as computerized as possible create as many digital systems within the organization to save time to save uh, effort and use the data available to us for taking quick decisions mm. and therefore once we adapted uh, computers or uh, technology in our organization in the earlier part of our journey that means in the mid 90s we completely built systems using technology to run the company that mm-hmm. means a lot of what we do today also is driven by data mining and data management within the organization mm-hmm. um, right from design to development to customer engagement to providing customer valuable insights to data whether it is manufacturing mm-hmm. and marketing based data all of this is now generated automatically through our digital system and we run our entire company based on in house erp that we've created through an it team oh. so all of this is driving the company seamlessly but we always enter every day with the thought that whatever we are doing we can do it better, better. in some way right. so that means that thought cannot go away because we always feel that whatever we are doing is not the best and there is a better way of doing the same mm-hmm. thing and that is the mantra that helps us keep innovating thinking every day when we enter a workplace mm-hmm. interesting so when we talk about manufacturing uh, and uh, industries that are dealing into products with this whole global warming and the global boiling that we are now experiencing we mostly blame the business houses and the industries because so much of manufacturing is happening that is why our rivers are getting polluted our environment is getting polluted so how do you you know keep a check on the by products of your production or what are the steps that you take as an organization to ensure that not much of damage is happening to the environment great question in fact uh, we have learned a lot from our customers all our clients in uh, the developed world europe america today are forcing us to minimize our carbon footprint mm. that means they are forcing us to go through agencies who handhold you who train you who guide you 
on how to reduce your carbon footprint and also how to remove the uh, various aspects which are against the environment. Yeah. That means we are doing a lot of things. We are spending a lot of money to improve systems, processes within the company, doing exactly the same thing, but in a more friendly environment way. friendly way. And that is something which is driven by our customers, which is a very huge learning process for us. And we are in turn teaching our suppliers in India to also kind of fall in line with that thought process. And that is very critical because, you see, we may not be able to contribute hugely, mm. but together as a community of manufacturing companies, industry, we can put that figure together and make it a big impact on whatever we are doing to the environment. And of course, when we, we built our new plant in 2017, uh, where we currently exist, that plant was designed keeping in mind that we would not harm the environment in whatever possible way we could. Mm. So that's one thing I think all the business houses should keep in mind. Absolutely. Whenever they are venturing into any kind of products that they are dealing with. It's been over 50 years of, uh, you know, successfully running your business. What keeps you motivated and happy and, you know, doing what you are doing? Well, first and most important is we have continued on the path of good ethics. Okay. That means we don't work like a machine. We are empathetic to not just our workforce, but to our suppliers, to our customers. We are very aware of their needs. Uh, we build in a lot beyond just a relationship. Mm. We build an ecosystem for uh, all the components of our business to work in a happy environment. And happiness doesn't mean that, you know, you create a happy workplace. Mm. You have to create a situation where you're doing the right things, which are experienced by the people who are connected with you. Okay. For example, now if you open the balance sheet of the company, what do you see in it? Mm. You see the assets, you see the liabilities, you see the turnover, you see the profit, you see the expenses and so on and so forth. What you don't see in a balance sheet, which can actually help you understand if the company is a good company or just a profit making company, mm -hmm. is the aspect of uh, finding, uh, for example, in our case, we have in 50 years never, never delayed the payment of salary by even one day. Mm -hmm. That means if there is a stipulated date, we distribute salary on that date. If there is a holiday on that date, the day before. If both days are holidays, then a day before, before, but never beyond. Now that you will not find in our balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Secondly, our suppliers, all our suppliers, get their payments on a particular date as per our agreement, 30 days, 45 days, credit terms, whatever they may. Mm -hmm. On the stipulated day, the money is in the bank of the supplier without having to get a phone call or reminder or anything. Never. No. Now, these things are not found in a balance sheet. That means how we treat our suppliers, how we treat our employees. employees. Even during COVID for two and a half months that we were shut down, the salaries were delivered to their bank accounts. Because their need was more than our need. Mm. And they had children uh, to feed. They had liabilities to fulfill. So their money, whether they worked or they did not, the money was in their banks. So this is something we kind of build as a relationship. We don't uh, build a relationship and create a business. We build everything together. Mm. So that is very important. And that is what we have emphasized on in terms of creating ethics. For example, um, in the earlier days, our policies of the government and even whatever small companies were going through was to incentivize them to stay small. Mm. There was not enough opportunity for businesses to grow big. And the reason was there was too much regulation, there was too much, uh, too many compliances to do and the small business never wanted to do all of that. So he would Avoid getting into a registered mode. But if you want a business to grow, you have to allow them 
to do everything smoothly focus on the business not on compliance not spending half their time fighting with this mm-hmm. officer that officer True. that department this department so if you have all that time to focus on your work your business will grow and unfortunately because of these huge compliance issues even our financial advisors 30 40 years ago would tell us ki sir aap itna paisa to in sab cheezon mein faltu ka dete hain aap tax bachane ke liye ye kar lijiye wo kar lijiye now if you don't pay taxes your balance sheet will show no assets because mm-hmm. if you don't save money how will you invest in assets True. and that is what we did as a company we paid because fortunately we were in the export business we were not uh, kind of paying income tax to the extent that a normal business would pay okay. so we saved money and we built our assets but we slept peacefully at night we did not violate anything we complied with everything and that is another aspect which i think all businesses must understand is that if you want to grow make sure you follow all the rules, rules and, and regulations, regulations yeah. and you comply and you can outsource this today today it is actually possible to outsource a lot of the regulation you don't have to have full time people and secondly once you've done the compliance show good profits in your company and pay the taxes mm. because even after paying taxes what is left is wealth of your company mm. which you can build upon so these are very very crucial aspects which today's generation must learn that paying tax is today not a dirty word i am talking of times when we actually paid a bank rate of interest of 14 15 even 18% mm. so if you are paying 18% interest on what you borrow what will you earn in your business yeah. you are earning for the banks at that time so what do people do cut corners mm. uh, break laws and generate a lot of cash but no income in on the balance sheet mm. and that takes away a lot of your energy you know managing yeah, all of all, it exactly mm. and and you know and you don't sleep well because yeah. you don't know when something might go against you true so i think that is a very important aspect of running any business is mm. to uh, do it in a regulated compliant manner pay your taxes build your business and create the wealth within your own company own company very beautifully summarized because lot of the times we have seen that you know people tell you not to enter business because of these things that yeah. you know if you're running a business it's a 24 hour thing you will never sleep constantly you have to work whereas if you are in a service sector you are an employee somewhere then you can you know afford to close your system 6 o'clock and get your salary on time so a lot of people don't venture into business because of these things but what you have shared is so important that if you don't cut corners if you are compliant you follow the rules and regulations you pay your taxes you can have a good sleep and that shows on your face you know you're calm composed and i'm sure you're having a very happy life so if if i have to have ask you directly what role spirituality plays in your life in your business and uh, how is it a transformative process for you well i'm not an extremely spiritual person hmm. but i have a lot of faith in uh, god as okay. or whichever form you can say that would be but that faith in his presence in helping me do the right things at the right time is very important and with that faith and conviction i take all my decisions of course there are there have been times where you have uh, had situations which were negative for your business uh, there were certain bad periods for your business due to various reasons but you can't lose your faith and that is what kept us going you know the the faith in your ability and his support mm-hmm. is very crucial for anybody to and i don't think you should waver in that it should be absolutely unwavering mm-hmm. uh, in terms of your faith and uh, in our organization also we uh, give due space to every religion we have uh, a workforce of 120 people over 30 are uh, women and they come from all walks of life all religions and we celebrate all the religions together mm-hmm. and in they have different festivals on different days but for us it is a celebration of god and it can be in different forms and different dates and that's something that i uh, i think even in those few in our organization who may not have that faith have to become a part of that ecosystem yes. so yes it is the essence of spirituality 
is very important. Mm. So, you know, we build businesses, whatever we do, at the end of the day, all of us want to be happy and have a good sleep at night. What is your mantra for a happy and healthy life? Well, first of all, um, as perhaps I shared with you a little while ago, when you wake up in the morning, if you have a smile on your face, uh, a spring in your step, and you're ready to face anything that comes your way during the day, you're ready to face the day and face the day happily, uh, I think whatever you're doing is absolutely fine. The day that does not happen, mm -hmm. you need to introspect and figure out what is it that you're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of balancing, work-life balance, it is very important that if you are doing, if you are working, working hard is absolutely fine, but uh, working smart is even better. Mm. That means you have to work smarter. How to manage your time is very important, whether it is family, whether it is work, whether it is friends, edit, everything else, even spending time on social media for that yeah. matter. So this time management is very important. Mm -hmm. And above all of this, if you don't uh, manage your time well, including that little period of time which you need to give to yourself which is and for yourself it includes your health mm -hmm. so all of this is something that you have to schedule by yourself and this comes out of uh, learning from other people's experiences and not the hard way mm -hmm. i know a lot of kids uh, youngsters who in the passion of becoming successful are burning out very quickly yeah and uh, at a very young age today they are uh, unhealthy they are mentally very depressed in mm. terms of not being able to achieve what they wanted to achieve and because of the la very uh, long work hours their uh, uh, personal capability levels are affected mm. and therefore it is important for uh, everybody today who is wanting to start a business that from day one, I mean, if the startup space, people are working 18, 20 hours because yeah. they are competing against uh, somebody who might be doing the same thing somewhere mm. else. Which you said that, you know, if you're not the first one in that space, you yeah. have to burn everything that you have to, you know, create that niche yes. for yourself. So for that, you need to have a good team. Mm -hmm. You need to have good systems. You need to have good time management. Yeah. So all this, of course, maybe as an entrepreneur, as a person who's just starting business, he or she may not realize what needs to be done. This is where you need a mentor. Yeah. And that is what mentoring does. It helps you channelize your energies in the right way so that whatever you are trying to do is maximized because you are dividing the time in that proportion. Okay. So who is your mentor or you know role models that you have had in life or you look up to people? My father, of course. I mean, he was... Uh, whatever I am doing today is uh, out of huge learning. And uh, of course, I can't step into his shoes uh, because uh, he had a huge aura of whatever he did. And he was a visionary, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, yeah. The kind you, of empire you know, you've created together. Absolutely. I mean, he and he was very liberal with his ideas in the sense that although he thought differently, he would never stop me from going ahead with whatever I thought because mm -hmm. even the initial initial effort to start and sell over into overseas markets. Um, I was coming from a different uh, angle in the sense that I knew my product, yeah. I knew rubber, but on the other side, he said, I mean, as any Indian would say in the 80s, India se kon khari dega. Correct. You know, so that he had a very valid argument in that respect that first we have to build technologically a factory which can serve the world. Mm -hmm. But I had the confidence that when you make a rubber product, it's not always the technology, it's the knowledge of how to bake the product. Mm -hmm. So we had a conf conflicting thoughts on that, but we came together yeah. as far as the end result was there. Mm -hmm. Any role models other than your father? Well, I have several. Um, they are icons in industry. Anand Mahindra is one of them. Mm. Ratan Tata is another. So these are people you keep learning from. I mean, yes. if you read about what their journey has been, there is a never-ending stream of thoughts and experiences that they can share with you. So, uh, not any one single role model, but yes, mm. uh, a collective set of people who, who provide you the necessary tools to take your journey forward. Beautiful. 
So one last message that you would like to give to everyone, whoever is watching this video. Well, um, you know, it's, it's uh, something I again shared with you that a successful businessman was uh, once asked about the secret of his success. Mm -hmm. And uh, the interviewer had just a few minutes and he smiled back and said, the secret of my success is in two words. And the answer was good decisions. Mm. Followed up with a question by the interviewer that how do you take these good, good decisions? decisions yeah. And uh, the, uh, the gentleman said, well, experience. And uh, the follow up question was, but how do you get that experience? <laughs> and the answer to that was two words, bad decisions. Mm. So the takeaway that I think is uh, that failure is a must. And till you experience failure, you will not enjoy the success. Mm. And that is crucial for everybody. But your path to success may be different from person to person. True. Your situations may be different. But the size of the opportunity today in this country is huge. huge. That mm -hmm. means we are in a very sweet spot as far as the opportunity size is concerned for young entrepreneurs who want to either uh, go forward professionally or even as entrepreneurs. Either way, the size of the opportunity is huge. We have an ecosystem today which supports that growth story. And um, it is important to have a mentor mm -hmm. who helps you connect all the dots before uh, you go astray. And therefore, once you're on track with your passion, your dream, your goals, and as I said, plan B is a must. must. So as you said that, you know, we are in a sweet spot. Do you think the dream of 5 trillion economy that India is seeing is possible? Very much so. In fact, uh, uh, I think 5 is just the starting point. Okay. We can be looking at a 10, 15 trillion dollar economy. Um, everything has to come together. It has to be a good government. It has to be good policies. Mm -hmm. It has to be good citizens. Yeah. And it has to be the entire world looking at us as a source of inspiration, whether it is technology, whether it is manufacturing, whether it is even areas today like space technology. Mm. So we are being looked at as the future of the world. And uh, China's time is probably waned mm -hmm. over, over the last five, 10 years. So we are probably at that inflection point which China was 25 years ago. Yeah. And I think in 80s, you broke that uh, Chinese customer and the market base with your kind of product, your commitment, your communication. So I'm sure. Yeah, today, we export to China today. Yes. So we actually export to China and it's a myth that Chinese make cheaper products. It's mm. not true. It's not true. Whatever we are making today or we are good at, we can compete with anybody in the world. Mm. It's only for the world to know and understand that. Very true. So more power to you and it was lovely having you. I'm sure we've gathered a lot of takeaways from your journey, which will help all the young entrepreneurs and I hope so. startups and business houses. Thank you so much for coming. Pleasure being here. Thank you.